So now that we know that we're looking at the MIPS assembly language specifically, it's probably good to take a moment and step back from the hardware itself and look at the assembly language and see what specifications in the assembly language might give us constraints when it comes to building hardware that will implement that assembly language. So we want to look at MIPS and how it works. The sort of programming structure for MIPS. We call it the programmer model. Uh, for what, for the, so the first thing we look at is the register file. In MIPS, the register file has 32 registers. Uh, these are named in special ways, and we will learn the names of these registers and why they are useful in certain contexts as we learn how to write code in the assembly language. But for now, it's enough to know that there are 32 registers labeled 0 through 31. 32 registers means it takes 5 bits to specify which register we're interested in. So we've already specified 15 bits in our instruction. Three registers, because it's a three, reg uh, three operand assembly language, we have to specify two source registers and a destination register. Each one of those takes five bits to specify, and that information can only come from the instruction. So if the instruction is 32 bits, already 15 bits worth of that is gone, taken up just by specifying which registers we're interested in. Okay. Each register also has a name, which again is part of the assembly language, not necessarily part of the machine code, but we have sort of a name that we can apply to that register to give us some idea of the context and conventional use of that register. In hardware, the registers are all identical, but in convention, which means our sort of decision on how to write code for this machine, we might treat some registers different than others. And this ends up being important when we write code that other people might have to look at and use. If we write code with a specific register, somebody else looking at our code will look at it and say, ah, I know because you reused register S that when I pass this to another subroutine, I have to be responsible for saving its content before the subroutine initiates. We'll learn subroutines later. Don't worry about any of that now. But the important thing to recognize is that the registers have names and those names imply higher level functions even though the lower level functionality of the register is identical. These are the names. So again, this information is on this sheet, which you have access to, you can download and print out and use uh, whenever you need to. Um, the names of these registers correspond to their conventional functionality, uh, and they are listed like this. So first of all, the zero register is just the value zero. You can't store anything into it. All you can do is load the value zero. Why that exists is because comparing things to zero is such a common thing to do that we wanted to have a special purpose register just for comparing things to zero. So that's what we have. We have uh, register one is a reserved register special for the assembler. The assembler is a special bit of code that allows the, um, allows the assembly language to be converted into machine language and some little translations happen during that process that, that might need a register here or there. So that is reserved for the use of the assembler. It's called the assembler temporary, or AT. Then we have two registers called V, which are primarily used as return values from procedures. We have four registers called A, which are primarily used as arguments to procedures. Then we have registers that are called temporary and saved, a few sets of those. And then we have uh, some special purpose registers at the end of the register file called pointers. And these are again used uh, for special purposes for procedure calls, which we'll look at later on in the course. The important thing here to know is that if I ask you which register T0 is, you look at this table and say T0 looks like it's register 8. Okay, so T0 is register 8, that's here. And so if I said, what is the uh, contents of the register address for T0 in the instruction, you're going to look at T0, you're going to say it's 8, and you're going to remember that 8 is 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and those then are the five bits that tell the computer that it wants T0 in the next instruction. Okay, so that's what we're going to use. So that's the register file for MIPS. The memory structure for MIPS which you'll see later on as we start to load and store information from memory. This is all the sort of structure and content of the data memory uh, that the ALU addresses to get information back and forth into the registers. 
most memory is 8 bits wide. MIPS is no exception. The memory elements themselves are 8 bits wide, which means if I want to load a 32-bit number from memory into a register, that's actually four separate operations. Okay, the, the specifics of that will be covered in more detail later on, but it's worth knowing that that's the case. Um, because we have to load four things to get one full word, we have to know whether we're loading the least significant byte first or the most significant byte first. We use a phrase called endianness to specify, and for MIPS, it's little endian. So we load the little end first, we load the, the least significant byte of a, of a four byte word in the lower memory addresses. And again, the details of all this will come. So it's worth looking at this and reminding yourself. Uh, it's possible to load and store smaller information than a word. A uh, byte, you can load and store a byte and there are some contexts for that. And you can load and store double words and there are some contexts for that as well. <clears throat> so the word word <laughs> is used to describe a single sort of piece of information. For most computers, it's the same size as the address space. So for MIPS, it's the 32-bit address space. 32-bit words. 64-bit um, computers are common now, and even 128, 128-bit uh, computers are also becoming more and more common now, and so the memory spaces are much, much bigger. Uh, but the 32-bit memory space is, is plenty for our purposes. It means if you generate a 32-bit address to specify some piece of information from data memory, it means that the data memory could conceivably be 4 billion bits long, 4 billion addresses long, which is 4 gigabytes, which isn't really that much <laughs> in today's computer systems. Um, but back when I was a kid taking this stuff, it was inconceivable that a computer could have 4 gigabytes of memory in it. Nowadays, 8 gigabytes is standard, so how these things change. The assembly language is going to be specified in this way, and again, you will learn this stuff in labs and assignments and everything like that, but this is an introduction. Uh, we have an optional label, and then we have a keyword which specifies the operation that this instruction is going to accomplish, and then optionally we have parameters, and optionally we have comments. Uh, you don't, some keywords, uh, some operands have no parameters or no operands, um, opcodes and operands, opcode and operand. Some opcodes so the keyword is the opcode, and the parameters specify the operands, usually. There are some instructions that have different parameters, but most of the common instructions we're going to look at, the parameters of the instruction specify the operands that the opcode will operate on. And then you can put comments onto it so that you can understand what's going on. So when you write assembly code, you're going to write instructions like this. And it's just going to be one instruction after each other, and in general, each instruction will be translated to one machine code instruction that will be loaded from instruction memory, stored, uh, lo addressed by the program counter, loaded from instruction memory, and presented as control inputs to the rest of the hardware of the computer. So in high-level language, you write an instruction that says add two numbers together, right? A equals B plus C, for example. In machine code, you specify typically, and in fact in the MIPS machine code, you specify the op code first, and then the operands, and for MIPS we specify the, the destination first, and then the two sources. And these get translated into 32 bits of specification for what the machine should actually do. So in this case, if I say add A, A and add B and C and put the result in A, A equals B plus C. In assembly language, I write add T8, S2, S1, assuming those are the registers where A, B, and C uh, variables are stored currently. And then those get translated a third level into assembly language. We have an instruction, which is a bunch of ones and zeros that tells it what to do. Uh, we have ones and zeros that tell it what our operands are. We have more ones and zeros that tell it more things. And the really cool thing about this is that you will learn all of these things for every instruction in the operation. And this is what this sheet is for, is that tells you all of the ones and zeros for every instruction that you want. So if I want to add two unsigned numbers, then I have to give these six zeros and then a bunch of, a bunch of 
uh, register specifications, and then these six ones and zeros, and that will tell the computer to do that unsigned add instead of a signed add or whatever. And there's lots of different instructions that you will learn how to use and lots of different um, encodings of those instructions for the operation of the computer itself.